Let's welcome Steve Mnuchin, former Treasury Secretary, United States of America. Great to be back here with you and uh, thrilled to be live in person. What a great honor to be with one of my favorite finance ministers to be at this conference. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary, and it's a pleasure uh, to be here at the FII and a pleasure to see you uh, in real life, as you said, uh, finally after uh, so many screen meetings, and a sincere pleasure to be in Riyadh, where every time I visit, really feel the buzz and the energy and the positivity, uh, which uh, really validates what we've always known, which is that our most valuable resource in the region is our human capital, and to see uh, all of the uh, great initiatives and projects that are happening uh, and that are driving forward a brighter future for the whole region. Well, we, we had the opportunity to work together on so many important issues over the last few years. Uh, you know, I would say, obviously, what we've all been through with COVID was quite extraordinary. I, I must tell you, uh, look, looking back at this in January of 2020, when I was in Davos, and then fast forwarding to March, when, uh, you know, ne never thought we'd be shutting down both travel as well the entire U.S. economy. Uh, we, were, we were really fortunate that in the U.S. everybody came together. I was pro most proud of we passed two bills, 96 to 0 and 100 to 0, the CARES Act. I never thought I'd be spending $4 trillion that quickly, but I, I do think it was really necessary, and we, we fortunately uh, avoided a global depression, not recession. I, I think nobody ever anticipated that COVID would last this long. But on the, the same standpoint, I think we were really pleasantly surprised in how big parts of the economy were able to perform remotely. Obviously, things like travel and tourism and hotels got devastated. But the fact that we were able to sustain so much economics is important. And, uh, you know, obviously, the region is very important. And I'm glad to see the economic rebound in the region as well. It's uh, certainly. Uh a, a challenge that was greater than anybody anticipated, uh, even at the beginning of COVID. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, it takes a, a great crisis uh, to galvanize the thinking, uh, to uh, really uh, spur innovation, uh, and uh, ensure that we are uh, positioning ourselves uh, better for the future. One of the important aspects in Bahrain, uh, His Royal Highness the Crown Prince and Prime Minister, always made sure that as we were uh, making a decision, looking at a policy, that we were always looking through the tunnel and seeing how it would impact, uh, what would be its impact on the other side. And that became very important to ensure that our decision making uh, was, was, was always uh, in the right frame to position us best coming out of, of the recovery. And, and today, uh, as you can see across the region, uh, and in the Gulf in particular, uh, that this crisis was really defined by uh, leadership and defined by how uh, a combined team effort uh, could uh, be put together to, to overcome the challenges. Uh, there are, um, it, it has, of course, uh, there's been devata devastating costs on a personal level, devastating costs uh, on a human uh, level, uh, and also devastating economic costs as a result. But the way in which we looked at the priorities uh, in Bahrain uh, was very clearly defined. Number one, protect society from the health, uh, from, from, from the health impact of COVID. Number two, protect the economy from the economic impact of COVID. And then number three, where we are now, is to ensure that we're protecting that growth, putting it on a sustainable path, and turbocharging it where we can use policy to turbocharge it. Well, as, as you said, look, there's no question that the number one priority was the health priority. 
Um, you know, in previous economic crisis, it was because of financial issues or financial markets. Th this was an economic crisis that was caused by nobody's fault, really a health issue. And anybody who ever invested in businesses and ran downsides, nobody ever looked at zero revenues as a downside. So this was really something none of us expected or could have expected. I will say, you know, uh, obviously the medical breakthroughs were extraordinary. The fact that the world was able to create vaccines as quickly as they could, this is a process that normally would have taken so many years. So the investment, the economic investment in the vaccines, the medical investment, uh, you told me on the way in, I was thrilled to hear you're in the, the low to mid 90s in terms of vaccinations in Bahrain, that's, that's important. I think we need to continue to, to focus on areas of the world that don't have this benefit, but clearly we wouldn't be sitting here today if it weren't for the advances in medical science. On the other hand, you know, the economic issues are gonna take a long time to recover from. In, in the U.S. alone, you know, we used to talk in billions, now we're talking in trillions. We took on trillions of dollars of, of additional debt. Uh, the U.S. economy is, is now rebounding, very strong. My expectation is for the next 18 months, we see a very big economic rebound. But unfortunately, we do see inflation. So for a long time, uh, the Federal Reserve was concerned that we couldn't get inflation to 2%. Now I think we're at something like 5%. I know different people have different opinions. My own opinion is it, it is concerning and something that is going to continue on and something that we're, we're all going to have to deal with. So I think we're now going to have to deal with uh, interest rates uh, becoming normalized, uh, intervention becoming less, both on the fiscal and the monetary side. And we're, we're going to see the economic consequences of that, which, uh, again, for some businesses, this is going to be a booming time, and other areas will be, be more difficult. Uh, ab absolutely. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned inflation. Uh, clearly, uh, one of the big risks in the upcoming period. Uh, and, and what we have seen, even over the last one and a half days, very few people are talking about inflation. Uh, and and there has, there's a very sanguine... Uh, uh, outlook towards inflation at the moment uh, compared to what's happening at an underlying level. So you look at shipping costs are double what they were last year. You're looking at energy costs in, in the US are up anywhere from 25 to 50 percent or more. Uh, in Europe, natural gas prices are up uh, sevenfold or more. And inflation cannot be less than the sum of its parts and that will have its impact. Uh, and so when we look uh, towards the future, one of the important aspects in the short term and medium term that has to be taken into consideration is there has been an unprecedented amount of liquidity unleashed at a global level. And as policymakers start mopping up that liquidity, there has to be a very fine balance between ensuring that if you do it too slowly, inflation becomes a real risk based on the numbers that we're seeing. And if you do it too quickly, you know, what's the risk of triggering a default cycle at the corporate or sovereign level? And so there has to be a very fine balance as, as to how that unprecedented liquidity is pulled back in. Uh, and, and that is one of the big things that we are watching. Uh, how does the inflation on its component levels translate into a change in the CPI? Well, I, I think you're completely correct. And, you know, Think of it, uh, there's so many people in the investment world that have never lived in anything but zero or one percent interest rates. So, you know, e even three and a half percent interest rates are still low by a historical, but will create issues. And look, you, you commented on energy prices, uh, you know, again, on the things that I never thought I'd see in the world. Uh, forget zero on, on oil, but I never thought I'd see Thank negative you. oil prices. I remember saying to President Trump, we need to fill up the strategic reserve as much as we can. Unfortunately, we had lots of cash, but we didn't have the authority to spend it. But I, I do think stable energy prices are so important to the region and to the world economy. 
uh, there, there's no question that, you know, through COVID, lower energy prices created significant economic issues in the region and in different parts of the world. And, and now the rebound in the demand has created uh, excessive and inflationary issues. As, as you comment, just the, the, the cost of shipping, and we're beginning to see that in, in the economy and in, in really so many issues, both in supply chain and, and in prices. But I do think stable energy prices are so important. Um, I, I do think, uh, you know, I, I know there's a big focus on carbon, and that's obviously an issue that we need to deal with over time. My own opinion is I think we'll see some pretty significant advances in technology for carbon recapture and things along the way. But uh, obviously, the fact that there'll be stable production here will be good to the region. Uh, economic stability is important for this area and important for the world. Absolutely. And one of the things that uh, you know, we have to contend with is uh, as as energy prices increase, we should also ensure that we are maintaining momentum uh, around adjusting uh, our fiscal positions uh, and, and not uh, uh, getting too comfortable in a higher energy price environment. And the reason that that is important uh, is because one of the most important aspects of what we're doing, for example, uh, in the Kingdom of Bahrain, we launched uh, the fiscal balance program in 2018 uh, with the aim of balancing the budget. And so many people would ask me about that and say, ah, this is a revenue-raising uh, program. So, well, yeah, that's, but that's only part of the picture. Um, then, okay, it's a cost reduction program. Yeah, but that's also only part of the picture. What it really was, was to ensure that the correlation between economic growth and the fiscal position would switch to a positive one. What was happening in many countries in the region, Bahrain included, was as the non-oil economy was growing, the government would need to provide more services. And that comes at a cost. At the same time, the governments were not doing enough to raise non-oil revenue. There were very few revenue items that were positively correlated to economic growth. So getting to fiscal stability has to do with ensuring that you are creating a positive correlation to the non-oil GDP in the country. As oil prices go up and as oil prices come down, that is great, it can drive capital investment cycles, and it can provide long-term infrastructure on which you build. But really, the important aspect is to ensure that we are positively correlating to non-oil economic growth in the region. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, and I, I know we were actually talking about this as, as we were waiting earlier and had a, a, a chance to reconnect. It, it, it's so important for Bahrain and all the countries in the region to expand their economy outside of, of energy. It's, it's really critical. I was with the Crown Prince yesterday, and I must say, uh, I, I really admire what he's trying to do here, his, his vision for expanding the Saudi economy. And obviously, it's, it's, it's very important to create more jobs. There's a growing youth here. But I, I think the, the direction that this country is going in terms of its investment in the, the non-oil economy is, is truly extraordinary. And uh, you know, I've, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in the region over the last five years and be with all of you. And, and, and seeing the achievements and the vision and now watching all of you execute on this. But I, I think this is so important, as you said, for the transition. Absolutely, and we can see in, in, in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, His Royal Highness, uh, the Crown Prince, has uh, outlined a very clear vision and also matched, uh, alongside that, matched it with robust execution to ensure that the non-oil economy is expanding, and it's the real opportunity today. The real opportunity in our economies is to ensure that we are unleashing further non-oil economic growth. Uh, and it's great to see the big strides that have happened. You mentioned energy, uh, Secretary, and one of, one of the important aspects is, you know, if we look at the technology revolution, in reality, the entire technology revolution was only transformational in the way that we generate, transmit, and consume data. 
that was it. It had incremental changes to other things, but it was only transformational in that sense. And as we were assessing and thinking through where is the next big transformational change, uh, our, our thinking is that the big transformational change will be in the way that we generate, transmit, and consume energy. And that's going to be the big thing that would be very different 20 years from now than it is today. It does take into consideration um, the climate change uh, emer emergency that, is, that has emerged and that we, have to do, that we have to do things on that matter. And as well, that technology in the field is moving so rapidly that it will fundamentally change the way that we do uh, generate, transmit, and consume energy. Well, you know, you, you talk about uh, data and transformational technology. So one of the things I'm spending a lot of time on now in my new life, and uh, I, I miss all of you in the finance minister world, is as we have more and more data and we become more and more reliant, the issue of cybersecurity. Absolutely. So this was an area when I was in the government, I was responsible for cyber for all of financial services and spent a lot of time. But now from an investment standpoint, we're very focused in technology to protect against cyber attacks, to focus on data privacy, national security, because as, as you comment, th this, this impacts everything. As we think about our energy infrastructure and everything around the world, keeping it safe and secure is, is so critical. Uh, absolutely, and, and along with that, uh, you, you need uh, a lot of human intelligence to go with um, uh, the artificial intelligence and the data um, uh, efforts and, 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 and technology that, that is, that's there. And therefore, uh, again, uh, in this part of the world, uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the most important aspects is the quality of the human resource that you find in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, that you find in Bahrain, that you find in many countries in the region, uh, has really been driving that. And we have seen global companies, uh, we have seen um, many local startups really benefit from an ecosystem in which there is a well-educated, um, youthful uh, labor force that is taking on a large challenge uh, and, and, uh, and, and really seeing the region come out ahead. And, and we see that in the Gulf, uh, there will be a lot more to do uh, as uh, technology becomes a larger and larger part of the economy. Well, I know we could sit here all afternoon and continue to talk it up, but I understand we're out of time, and I just want to thank all the people who are involved in putting on this great conference and having us here. It's great to be back at FII, and it's great to, to see everybody in person. So great to thank see you. you. It's a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Thank you.